Welcome, everyone. Well, uh, thank you for joining us in the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment webinar series. My name is Matt Bauhoff. I'm the director of the center. To learn more about what we do in the center, please visit our website, uh, join us on LinkedIn, and also subscribe to our YouTube channel. In the center, we have uh, nearly 30 experts in subsurface energy uh, working towards different aspects of, of subsurface energy, as you can see here. Some of the research that we do uh, is shown in these pie charts. So we have subsurface applications, technical disciplines, and engineering tools. Uh, we are very broad and, and diverse. We work with industry in many different ways. Some of those are through our industrial affiliate programs. Uh, some of those are listed here. The newest one is on carbon utilization, storage, and transportation. If you're interested in any of these, please contact us. These monthly webinars are informative, industry-driven webinars by researchers and collaborators in the center. Webinars are hosted on the second Tuesday of each month at noon via Teams, but you can also watch them afterwards on our YouTube channel. Some of the upcoming webinars are by Dr. Kwok Nguyen. He is going to talk next month about innovative conformance control with foam for subsurface applications and I may give the, the webinar in April. Uh, before introducing our speaker, I just wanted to remind you to please post your questions in the Q&A section, and our speaker will answer as many questions as they can um, at the end. We encourage you to post your questions as soon as you have them, and that way they'll be ready for our speaker when he does that. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker, which is Dr. Silvu Levescu, who's going to talk about acid stimulation during the energy transition. Silvio was recently the chief scientist uh, of the pressure pumping product line at Baker Hughes and has joined the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum Engineering and Geosystems Engineering faculty this fall as associate professor. He's also a member of our center. He brings expertise in research and development, innovation, commercialization, and intellectual property in the petroleum in industry and has more than 35 US patents and 70 papers and articles. He is also the 20, 2020 to 2023 data science and engineering analytics technical director on the Society of Petroleum Engineers International Board of Directors. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Levescu. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Matt, for the introduction and for inviting me. Uh, this is my first talk for the center. I just joined um, uh, our department almost five months ago, and uh, I'm still trying to find my way. I'm still trying to meet you know, all the students in, uh, in our department. So if anybody wants to say hi, please, uh, please stop by and, and let's chat. Um, this topic I chose today, I think is very relevant given the situation in our industry uh, in the coming years, um, as I'm going to explain. Um, most of the results I'm showing here uh, are based on my, you know, 10-year uh, plus of work with Baker Hughes and ExxonMobil. Um, and, and I'm trying to give an overview of, uh, of different technologies I have been personally involved with, but also to present uh, an overview of the current state of um, technologies in the in the industry uh, in terms of um, acid stimulation. So the outline, um, I'm, I'm going to define the problem uh, today and explain why I'm talking about acid uh, stimulation and what it is role in, in uh, during the energy transition. Um, and then from Acid stimulation, I'm going to talk about matrix acidizing and acid tunneling. I'm not going to talk uh, about acid fracturing. That's a different topic for, for today. Um, and, and so probably next time. But, but I'm going to talk about matrix acidizing in terms of analytics uh, using distributed data, um, temperature and acoustics. Um, and, and the goal is, is to help the operations with real time party schedule optimization. Um, and then, and then I'm going to talk also about uh, some of the advantages, disadvantages of, of using distributed data um, and, and uh, analytics. 
for marketing subsidizing and introduce a new technology, uh, talk about a new technology that uh, um, I, I work on uh, and introduced just before I left Baker Hughes. Um, and, and for both Matrix acidizing and acid tunneling. Actually, I'm going also to talk uh, what I'm planning to do with them here at uh, at UT. So um, on the on the plot from the left, um, it's is the most up to date I found. Um, it's actually from last year. The numbers for for this year they uh, they are not available yet. But what you can see here is that on the horizontal axis is, is the year starting 2019 all the way to 2026. Um, and on the vertical axis is the oil demand. Um, and so the yellow curve is actually the real uh, demand until today and then predicted in the for the next few years. Um, as we know very well, uh, because of the of the uh, demand destruction, um, in 2020, starting in 2020, um, we had a significant decrease, uh, uh, as shown here in the uh, by the yellow curve. But predicting uh, in the future what's going to happen in the next year is that with different measures, meaning higher efficiency for for energy usage, um, um, higher efficiency uh, and and change of behaviors of consumers, and then introducing or or uh, scaling up. Um, uh, electrical vehicles, EVs, and then on top of everything, including adding actually policies to curb demand, we see that all these curves predict that the oil demand will increase, and in the worst case scenarios, the, the, the demand will stay kind of, um, will plateau uh, sometimes next year, and after that will stay flat, right? Um, and so there is a significant demand for oil predicted in the future, no matter what policies, no matter what technologies, alternative um, uh, uh, energies are going to be introduced, right? Um, now, in terms of R&D funding, um, R&D expenditures, this is even more interesting because what we, sh what we see on the plot in the middle is that uh, the blue curves show until 2021, as I said, uh, when when these numbers were out, um, we see that in 2019, just before the the uh, pandemic, the R and D funding was quite flat and was predicted to be flat actually for the next two three years. Um, the the crimson line on top. Um, but then, because of the pandemic, we had a significant decrease in expenditures. And for instance, in um, in uh, 2020, um, the R&D expenditures decreased by 145 million dollars, billion dollars, and then last year it was another 140 billion dollars, and then this stand is going to continue for the foreseeable future, um, comparing to uh, the predictions before the pandemic. Um, and and this is just to put this in in perspective. What means is that actually in two years. The decrease in R&D funding was actually as large as a company like Chevron. So Chevron's capitalization today is about 170 billion dollars, meaning that in two years we pretty much lost a company like Chevron. Or if you want another comparison, um, you know companies like Conoco, Philips, uh, Statoil, BP, uh, all of them actually uh, have market capitalization lower than 145 billion dollars, meaning that each year now we are losing a company like like those, right? And I'm sorry to to name names. Uh, I just want to put in perspective what what this decrease in funding means. Um, and so now um, we know, for instance, this is a map from Schlumberger from this year, and and their prediction is that in the next years. Um, carbon reservoirs are going to provide more than half uh, of the oil production and almost half of the gas production um, globally, right? Um, and so, obviously, carbon reservoirs are very important for for the global oil production. But uh, uh, the story is a little bit different because I remember even in 2018 or 2019 when I was actually traveling um, to you know Europe, North Sea. Uh, or, or Middle East, for instance, to discuss with different operators um, technology roadmaps. Um, everything they told me at that time, I remember, was that uh, 
um, they didn't want actually new technologies to be introduced to produce more oil. So even before the pandemic, what they were focusing on was to maintain production with a lower cost. So several operators, even before the pandemic, asked us um, to come up with new technologies that would lower the cost um, of, uh, of the current production. And so in this context, um, um, acid stimulation, so matrix acidizing, is very important because we have a significant um, production from carbon and reservoirs. And if we want to maintain production for with a lower cost, then matrix acidizing probably is one of the most convenient, uh, you know, uh, methods that we have available to maintain production. And so, um, um, let me let me explain a little bit how matrix acidizing is done. And um, I have this uh, very simple schematic. And then and then my goal is to explain actually how we are using distributed data, so DTS, distributed temperature sensing, and acoustic uh, DAS uh, data to um, understand the performance of uh, matrix acidizing uh, operation and then how we can make better decisions using data. And so in general, uh, you know, for a, for a well in a carbonate formation, um, we may have, you know, the well may be cased, uh, maybe open hole. Here is open hole. So I have, um, I have, uh, I'm showing cement casing, and then I have um, this horizontal section to the right is open hole, meaning that um, the well doesn't have um, anything else in between the formation and the bore. Um, and so, um, in order to use fiber optic, uh, we need to deploy it somehow into the well, and it's not permanent installation, meaning that every time we want to do an operation like pumping acid uh, into the well, we need to, uh, first of all, to put the optical fiber inside the well. And so one way to do that, probably the most common way in the industry, is to actually use cold tubing, which is a very long pipe um, that can be inserted into uh, a well. Um, and and you know that cold tubing strings, of course, the sizes depend. Uh, they are between one inch and four and a half inch, I would say nowadays, and the lengths are um, um, anywhere up to you know thirty thousand um, feet long. Um, and so optical fiber is inserted in in cold tubing, and the cold tubing is really just a um, conveyance, you know, um, technology for the optical fiber. Um, acid needs to be pumped into the well to go into the open hole section that is stimulated. And so traditionally, cold tubing has been used for injecting acid. And, and so um, at, the, at the end of the cold tubing, we have this bottom hole noz nozzle or nozzles um, that can jet acid. Um, however, because of the sizes I, I, I said with cold tubing, uh, most of the matrix acidizing pumping now is run through the outside of the cold tubing. So in reverse order of this, um, uh, you know, arrow I'm showing um, in the in the angular space between the cold tubing and the well. Um, and um, um, it is done, it's called bullheading, and it's done just because uh, the area, the cross-sectional area is much higher. So that allows actually lower pressure drops due to friction uh, and higher volumes of, um, of uh, acid um, and higher pumping rates. Um, and so, and so, in this picture here, I'm assuming that I'm pumping acid uh, through the cold tubing, and the optical fiber is inside of cold tubing. Um, and then the, the acid flows outside of the cold tubing; it goes somewhere into the formation, and then whatever acid is not spent, um, or even the acid that is spent, if it's too much, goes up um, towards the um, the wellhead. Um, and so. This has been done, you know, um, like this for many years, uh, for decades actually. Now, what is new here in the last 15 years, I would say, is that um, we added optical fibers in them, and 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 so when they 
when we started to use optical fibers, you know, 15 years ago or so, um, it was a big thing. It was really expensive. Everybody was talking about that operation that has been done last year, you know, things like that. Nowadays, it become really routine. So, you know, um, optical fiber with in cold tubing for matrix acidizing operations are, are um, you know, available from several, uh, pretty much from all largest uh, oil field services companies, Schlumberger, Halliburton, Baker Hughes, uh, and then smaller companies as well. So, so it has become something very routine. Now, um, we use fibers um, in order to collect this distributed temperature and distributed acoustic data. So what happens is that when acid it uh, reacts with uh, with the formation, um, they it's a, it's a, a heat um, of reaction that uh, that um, increases the temperature, right? Um, and that temperature variation, um, theoretically, uh, if it's identified, um, will will help actually under uh, will help us understand where the acid is flowing into the formation. The problem is um, that reaction I was talking about is happening into the formation. So it's uh, happening away from the well. Um, and, and so the optical fiber is not capable of sensing that temperature difference. So then we have to come up with different different ways to measure um, how does it flows into the formation. Um, on top of everything, you know, for this picture um, I'm showing here, um, the well is horizontal, which is fine. Uh, however, most likely the optical fiber will stay on the bottom of the cold tubing because of the gravity, which will stay on the bottom of the well, meaning that if acid flows somewhere, you know, laterally or up, um, the optical fiber probably will not sense that temperature change. Um, and also the acoustic signal will not be as strong. Um, and so, um, you know, um, the way the industry is doing um, um, is measuring the, the temperature of the acoustic signal um, today is that um, acid is pump, very likely bullheading, as I mentioned, uh, because several advantages, and then the acid flows into the formation. When it flows into the formation, it creates wormholes, um, and then, you know, after some time, uh, the temperature of the coolest uh, um, acid that went into the formation and, and, and increased the, the very local temperature because of the reaction of the heat reaction starts flowing back. So the temperature keeps increasing and that temperature increased with the warm back. That's actually what we very likely measure with the optical fiber. And so we have significant data along the entire optical fiber that is either temperature or acoustic signal, and we try actually to come up with different mathematical models um, and data analytics to predict um, based on the temperature and acoustic signals to predict actually the acid flow into the formation to know where the acid went. And then if we can come up with that information, then we, we can put together all other information we have from the well. So uh, production data, um, you know, porosity, permeability, skin, wh whatever data we have from that well. Um, and then, and then we, we, we try to understand if we stimulate it well or we can stimulate it better. And so based on that decision, then we have to decide um, um, if we need to pump diverter, if we need to pump more acid, different acid, um, things like that. Now, <clears throat> everything is fine, but um, matrix acidizing, the way I describe it, is done by, um, uh, by um, uh, acid flowing into um, through the path of least resistance. So meaning that probably the, the locations that don't need to be stimulated the most will be stimulated the most. So because of that, actually, that's not effective. And that's the information we are trying to get with, uh, with um, data. Um, and so um, here uh, I have some pictures showing that with optical fibers inside of cold tubing for different matrix acidizing operations, on the left, that's um, acoustic signal. So it's a very nice, uh, you know, uh, color map of signal. 
And so the operator, the engineer on location is looking at these and sees different temperature, uh, I mean, different acoustic noise variations. And so let's say blue here is, um, uh, is the most intense. And that means that probably that's where most of the flow happens, right? So on the picture to, in the center, uh, we see a lot of um, very nonlinear uh, plots. And these plots are actually from a well with a slaughter liner um, that had the fiber inside of cold tubing. And then the, the acid was pumped through the um, many orifices of the, of the slaughter liner. It, it flew into the formation and then um, the optical fiber was kept there for several hours until the temperature was you know, coming back to the geothermal um, uh, gradient. Um, so it was warming up. And so all these curves are temperature traces along the optical fiber taken at different times. They are highly nonlinear, um, very hard to model to find correlations to predict exactly how these temperature curves were created by acid flow and to um, directly correlate the temperature traces to, um, to um, uh, acid flows into the formation. And so both these figures show qualitative um, analysis of, uh, of the matrix acidizing, meaning that the engineer on location um, looks at this kind of plots and says, OK, so this is the, the highest noise uh, signal, the, 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 the warmest temperature, and so that's where the most acid went. Um, but but uh, this is just qualitative, and I saw many times when actually um, wasn't very accurate, this kind of analysis. So the, the goal is to come up with a quantitative analytics um, you know, method to predict, to interpret uh, based on temperature and, anal um, and acoustic signal uh, where the acid went into the formation. And then that information has to be made in real time um, to help the operators when they have still the equipment on location for matrix acidizing to uh, optimize the, the placement of the acid into the well for uh, you know the, the highest uh, productivity after the, the uh, stimulation. Um, so how do we do um, quantitative analytics? Um, so you know as I said we started about 15 years ago um, there are many many papers in literature with different kind of methods um, all of them follow a similar kind of workflow. So what happens is that um, it's called forward model um, during acid injection. So um, the optical fiber is inside the well, acid is pumped, um, and then and then uh, we solve actually mass momentum and energy conservation equations into the well. Um, and and these kind of equations are uh, are showing here and a radial diffusion equation into the formation. Um, we fully couple them and, and we solve them numerically. Um, and there are different, you know, simplifying assumptions we can make to even find analytical solutions, um, um, which which again, there are many paper about this uh, in literature. Um, but, but so what we are trying to do is actually to solve all these equations and to uh, obtain um, the rate from temperature, right? Um, however, this happens, as I said, only while pumping. And it's not really accurate. There are many interpretations in which acid actually doesn't flow directly into the formation. It can flow you know, up and down into the well along the, the cold tubing, along the, the optical fiber. And, and so at that time, the signal is very complex. And, and um, the problem is even if we come up with a solution, a unique solution for solving these equations, it takes time. Um, I'm not aware of any paper actually that can um, provide a solution or workflow that can be used in real time when the operation is ongoing. So, you know, within minutes, you get the, the temperature trace and then you, you, you know, you calculate uh, uh, the temperature, calculate the rate, um, uh, the, the acid rates uh, along the, the well, and then, you know, you say, uh, probably here the acid didn't flow into the formation, so I need to pump more here, or you know here went too much, so I need to put some diverter there and pump uh, more acid in other places. Um, so all these models actually are are really really intensive in terms of um, you know um, uh, a, a specialist, an expert that knows how to 
run with models, they are very um, uh, unique because each well is unique and things like that. Um, there are other things that we can do, and, and these are called inversion models in literature. And, and so again, there are many papers about these many variations of them, but um, inversion models are pretty much actually um, least squares, nonlinear regression algorithms in which we have um, we we have a certain interval of values, right? Um, and we try to um, we we find the solution by minimizing uh, an object function, which is uh, which defines the difference between a major quantity and the calculated quantity. In this situation, the quantity is temperature. So we have the major um, temperature from from PTS, and then we have the calculated temperature from uh, solving these equations. Um, and then we, we try to come up with, you know, different uh, least squares uh, uh, curve fitting uh, methods to um, just like I'm showing here on this plot um, to do um, some kind of matching uh, to minimize the, the object function. And then from there we find the acid rates along the well. So in this particular well, uh, for this particular interval of stimulation, um, I, I run actually um, I had to break the interval in, in several, you know, smaller intervals and I'm showing on the table just because it was really hard to run for the entire interval. Um, it pretty much was very time consuming, very, very peculiar manual work that I had to do to, to make sure that, you know, I find I find the solution. Um, and, and so even that, um, what I realized it was um, I, I couldn't find solutions point by point along the entire interval it was way too time consuming. And by the way, this was done after the operation. So it was truly just for me to understand how I can um, I can come up with an algorithm with an workload right um, to use in the future. And so what I did was actually to break the interval and instead of running piece by piece, I run, you know, I average for longer, you know, um, um, uh, discretization spaces, uh, um, space steps. And then I came up with this uh, table in which I said um, for each smaller interval, I got a volume of acid as a percentage of the total volume of acid flowing along um, the well into the formation. Right. And, and so, as I said, even this was very time consuming and this requires a lot of more work actually to make it, um, you know, more robust and, and faster. Um, but but so in addition to these, without um, DTS data, um, our industry had, you know, many, many um, simula uh, simulator for, um, simulators for matrix acidizing uh, uh, performance. And then, you know, we come up with, with data and then we calculate, uh, we calculate the uh, initial acid distribution um, and then we calculate the overall model and then we calculate the skin factor reduction. So this is with our DTS, right? The four, um, uh, four sections from the bottom. Now, if we have DTS data, meaning that we have that extra temperature, um, uh, you know, uh, that we measure. So what happens is that um, we also have the volume schedule and everything we did, right? So um, that different correlations in literature that um, can't relate the major temperature to porosity and permeability distribution along the well. And we know that in carbonates, actually the porosity and permeability can vary, you know, significantly along a, a, a well um, length. Um, but, but if we get those, we make our models, existing models more robust, right? Um, and so even that, Actually, the problem is uh, that many, many challenges in terms of data. Um, some of them are listed here. And, and I will say again, from my experience in the field, um, the number one challenge is actually the fact that we get huge amounts of data, right? We can get traces every second. We can get traces temperature, you know, um, uh, traces every every five seconds. However, we, we set up our system, right? Um, and uh, and acoustic data the same uh, large volume terabytes of data uh, for only one operation and then and then we have to uh, somehow save these you know um, to the cloud and and transfer them on a server somewhere somehow right and and it sounds great when you have good connection internet connection but sometimes you know our wells are not 
where we have the best internet connection, right? So that has always been a challenge. Even nowadays, it's a challenge. Um, and also it's a, it's a cost of data communication, right? So if you try to get a service provider, then you know you have to make sure that uh, the service is reliable and you get enough uh, uh, bandwidth and, and all that kind of things. Um, another thing that I think is quite challenging is the fact that um, all these temperature and acoustic traces are, are distributed, meaning that we have point by point a long, very long intervals, you know, uh, tens of thousands of feet. Uh, that's a challenge because again, we need to automate somehow the system and, and right now it's too much data for us to extract, you know, useful information. It takes too much actually for a data scientist to go and to look and to understand what's happening and how the data can be, you know, um, used. And so that's, that's challenging. And, and in addition to the space, you know, distribution, we also have time distribution, right? As I said, we have um, traces every second, every five seconds or whatever. Um, and, and another thing with the industry progressing the way it, did, uh, it has done in that last 10 years is that um, in order to lower cost, many operators actually divide work um, when they do an operation between different services companies. And so um, one company can provide the software, for instance, and another software can, uh, another company can provide the hardware. That's really challenging, right? Because those two companies need to talk with each other. And, and sometimes if they don't, they don't have the same, you know, um, uh, formatting uh, compatibility or, or things like that for and that data structure, then um, you know, already, Day it's a problem, right? Um, now, in terms of data analytics and interpretation, um, the fiber condition and configuration may change in time. So, if the fiber is exposed to acid, if the fiber is corroded by any means, you know, even even humidity uh, or dryness can can uh, uh, affect the fiber itself. Um, so, all these are issues. And then the fiber inside the cold tubing may not be necessarily straight meaning that if it's not straight, it doesn't interpret actually the depth very well. Um, and so and so we need to come up with different ways to make sure that the data is either straight or we know exactly where the end of the fiber is inside the well. Um, so we can calibrate actually the depth with with uh, whatever readings we have from the fiber and from the other logging tools. And um, and um, another thing that uh, I, I would say is that um, I didn't mention this, but most of the um, um, all, all the measurements are done when the fluid doesn't flow. Um, so what happens is actually if the fluid flows next to the fiber, there will be um, you know the data will will have a lot of noise and and it will be really hard to extract actually meaningful data from from that kind of operation. So this is why. You know, um, most of the measurements I show, they are done um, uh, after the fluid uh, uh, stops flowing or, or it doesn't flow next to the fiber, right? It flows uh, outside of the cold tubing, for instance. Um, and, and again, in terms of data analytics and interpretation, despite our efforts for matrix acidizing to come up with a model that can be used very simplistically in real time, uh, I'm not aware of any such a model, and and this is something that I'm 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 working on. Um, uh, I'm continuously working on. Um, one more thing I would like to say about this before I jump to something else. So, um, in terms of um, um, I, I said DTS and DAS. So now the fiber can be exactly the same inside the the same quality being inside the same well. Um, we just can get different signals depending on different waves. Uh, so we get both distributed temperature sensing and um, uh, distributed acoustic sensing. And we can use them together, um, like I'm showing here on this uh, on this plot. Um, if you want more details, I'm, I'm listing the, the paper number there. Um, so the colorful patches are acoustic data and the gray uh, patches are um, uh, temperature injection um, uh, data. Um, and the, the Dashed, the, the yellow dashed lines are the, the warm back um, uh, temperature uh, curves. And so, and so this is again a qualitative uh, you know, map. It relies heavily on the experience on the engineer on location. Uh, for this, actually, we didn't come up with any um, 
any analytical any any uh, uh, quantitative um, analytical uh, analytics model so when i mention all the uh, all the disadvantages of uh, of using optical fiber um, so so it does have advantages because you get distributed data along the, the entire well however the, the the fiber may not be in direct contact with the fluid. And so this is why, as, as I said before I joined UTI, I came up with this um, new technology that is essentially a buttonhole assembly uh, with sensors at the end of the cold tubing with sensors in direct contact with the fluid. And so what happens here, um, you see on the picture in the, on the bottom, um, acid is pumped through the cold tubing and through this buttonhole assembly and then is jetted radially into the formation. And so depending on where it flows, the two sensors will will sense will measure different temperatures. So it could be higher than the acid temperature or lower than the um, uh, acid temperature, right? Um, uh, I mean, not lower. The difference between the two sensors can be higher or lower. And so what happens here? Um, let me show you on 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 this plot. This is uh, from the field trial we did, um, you know. Um, last year. So what happens is that um, on this plot, I'm showing time on the horizontal axis and temperature difference between the two sensors on the vertical axis. The blue curves show the difference between the, uh, the temperature difference between um, uh, the two sensors. So now if the temperature difference is, is negative, that means that the acid is flowing below the two sensors. If the temperature is almost, you know, uh, temperature difference is almost zero, like in between there, it means that actually the, most of the acid flows into the formation between the two, you know, um, is, uh, is flowing radially from the bottom hole assembly directly into the formation. Um, and so the two sensors below and above that um, feel pretty much the same, measure pretty much the same temperature. And then if the temperature difference is, is above zero, is positive, it means actually the acid is, bo uh, is flowing um, um, above um, above the, the two sensors. And so that is the qualitative analysis that can be seen you know, in real time uh, when the operation is done. Now, what I did after that, and this is again work in progress, is based on your one job. Um, I came up again with the same kind of quantitative anal um, uh, anal analysis I, I did, I show earlier. I solve again the mass momentum and energy conservation equations into a well. Um, and I came up with this kind of, um, you know, um, um, predictions. So again, probably it doesn't matter point by point, um, inch by inch where the acid is flowing into the formation. What is important is actually on what interval and how much acid is flowing there. So the, the um, matrix acidizing uh, operation can be, can be optimized in real time. And so now I'm going to talk about one more technology. It's called acid tunneling. Um, and uh, this is again something that I spent many years uh, um, on. So um, what happens is that this bottom hole assembly uh, showing uh, on the uh, on the top left, it's a it's a metal cylinder with uh, a flow path inside. Can be um, run on cold tubing, and it has two joints. The two joints, so the, the bottom hole assembly actually bends from both two joints when the pumping pressure at the surface is increased above some certain um, certain value um, that is designed for. And so the acid acid is pumped through through the cold tubing and through the bottom hole assembly and then is jetted into the formation at a certain um, you know angle that again is designed. Um, and uh, and um, the tip of the of the bottom hole assembly has several nozzles. I spent several, you know, um, um, a couple of years actually trying to design those numbers, the pattern, the the size, and so on and so forth. Um, but when acid is pumped through the nozzles, is jetted into the, the formation, it reacts with the formation and it creates a cavity. If at the same time the cold tubing is is pushed down from the surface. This bottom hole assembly is pushed into the hole, and so it keeps increasing the hole. And actually, that hole looks like a tunnel, like in the uh, on the right picture here. Um, and so, um, theoretically, you know, any number of tunnels can be created in any 
open hole well. Um, and then and then still wormholes can be created with the acid that is not spent while creating the tunnel. Um, and and I have a very nice picture here for you to understand. Um, in terms of chemical reaction between the acid formulation and the formation, um, our our intent is to create actually to increase the reservoir contact, right? Uh, to increase the surface area. And so for the same volume of acid, if the tunnel is large, same area can be um, obtained with a much shorter tunnel than with a longer uh, tunnel with smaller diameter. And so our interest here is, as I said, to, to increase the, the area. Um, and so what we do is really to make sure that the tunnel is not large. It's just as large as needed to push the bottom hole assembly and cold tubing through it without um, uh, getting stuck. Um, many other technologies are available. Uh, acid tunneling again, uh, and I'm sure you know um, you are familiar with this. Um, some of them are showing here, um, and uh, they just use uh, flexible uh, hoses that can even be you know uh, metal hoses with with jetting nozzles in uh, in front. Uh, some of them use water, some of them use um, acid, some of them use uh, several acid needles at the same time. Uh, but again, because they are flexible, they cannot be controlled. So once they get into the formation, then really the, the uh, there is no control for how the tunnels are created. Right, but but these are very easy actually to put in any reservoir simulator. So um, even for the technology I was talking about, for the acid tunneling technology I was talking about, um, it's actually very easy to predict, and we have several papers to do, um, uh, on that. Um, if you want to increase the productivity of the well, or or the uh, you know uh, the production, or or even the injectivity of a, of a well, um, what you need to do is actually to put different uh, tunnels inside. Um, and then just to, you know, in a very simple reservoir simulator um, and, and then just to run the numbers and, and many operators have that capability, um, many of the operators I work with. Um, so I was saying that the, the flexible hoses don't have any control um, on the tunnel direction um, or size. Um, here actually, you know, we spend significant amount of time to understand how to design this bottom hole assembly in such a way that when it bends, um, then the the angle, um, the the kickoff angle, so the angle at which the tunnel starts to be created from the main bore, um, and the incidence angle, and then the the radius of the tunnel, all these uh, pretty much can be, you know, um, it's a it's a fun geometrical problem that needs to be solved, but all of them can be calculated. Um, and so, as I said, initially we spent a lot of time trying to design the nozzles. We did a lot of uh, full scale yard tests on carbonates at surface conditions, so no uh, bottom hole temperature, no bottom hole uh, pressure. And it was, you know, um, it, was, it was a lot of um, um, trial and error. Um, we, we came up with all kinds of patterns, uh, but but in the end, actually, a hexagonal pattern of nozzles with one in the center, so seven nozzles, um, provided the most round tunnel. Um, and, and so initially we started with this um, uh, average tunneling efficiency at surface condition of 0 0.17 barrels um, feet per barrel. So that means for each barrel of acid, we created actually 0 0.17 feet. Um, and then that was in the yard, right? That was a full uh, scale test. But then we took uh, we took this technology to the field and we did more than, um, you know, 500 tunnels uh, with with um, different treatments, acid treatments, um, different acid strength and different other conditions. Um, the, the tunnel lens varied greatly. Um, and, and so the, the longest was 120 feet with an average of 24 feet. Um, also the penetration rate and the, the tunneling efficiency, all of them varied greatly, right? Um, the problem is we didn't get any, um, any information from the field back about you know the reservoir conditions to understand exactly what happened, why it happened, and and so this is why um, I want to to pursue this kind of research here to run uh, full scale tests with different kind of acid formulations, different types of rocks, 
under different conditions, pressure, temperature, stress, and so on, to understand how acid tunneling can be, you know, optimized given a formation, um, you know, um, certain formation properties. Uh, as part of our research program, um, we we had, a, you know, um, a laboratory um, core flooding instrument in which we actually did have, could, um, could monitor um, pressure and temperature uh, and could increase the pressure and temperature uh, similar to those downhole conditions. Um, and, and so we also look at just injecting water, for instance, for the purpose of measuring the erosional effects, so mechanical effect versus the chemical effect of acid, right? In in different uh, limestone samples um, we try from Texas and, and Alberta in Canada. Um, and then we also build uh, another full scale uh, test um, that we run with um, different acid strength uh, in the yard again, um, as showing in these pictures. And so then we created all kinds of tunnels. As you can see here, we built a data set of, of um, uh, flow conditions of, you know, acid uh, properties and uh, acid volumes, everything. Um, and we were able actually to quantify, to come up with, uh, um, you know, um, data algorithms of what happened from our measurements with what happened in the field and then whatever we could predict for that particular type of uh, types of rock that we uh, we tested. Um, and, and more than that, actually, we even compare, uh, compared, as I said, the erosional effects versus the chemical effects um, for exactly the same conditions. Um, and then we were able, based on all these, um, you know, uh, measurements of all the simulations we did, uh, we were able to increase significantly the, the tunneling efficiency. So if you remember, we started with 0 0.17 um, feet per barrel, and then we we got close to 0 0.65. So we pretty much increased it fourfold. Um, and then there are many questions uh, without answers right now. And, and so that's part of what I'm trying to, part of the research I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, um, uh, to uh, continue here. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that, you know, I talk about matrix acidizing, I talk about acid tunneling, uh, both of them, you know, are, are established in the industry, um, but there is no direct comparison between how one performs, excuse me, versus the other. And, and that's a very hard, you know, hard thing to do because, you know, you have to go into the same well with the same conditions to make sure that you compare apples with apples, right? Um, and so we had only one chance to do that, actually, in a well in, in Western Venezuela. Um, the well was 8,500 feet uh, deep um, and, and it had an open hole completion. Um, now the well was new and when the expected production was only 800 barrels per day um, and, and it didn't happen. So what we did actually was first to matrix acidize it um, and for this, we use, you know, 225 barrels of 13% um, um, hydrochloric acid and 9% of formic acid. Um, and then, and then post-stimulation production rate was 380 barrels per day. Um, that meant the payoff of 15 days. So in 15 days of oil production, um, that operation, the intervention could be paid for. Um, for acid tunneling, so later actually after after you know the well uh, produced uh, for for some time, um, we went back and we did an acid tunneling operation again for the purpose of comparing the results. And so this time we pumped uh, we pumped much more acid. Um, we created sun, uh, seven tunnels with a total length of 138 feet um, uh, of total length, and and um, that was uh, what the the, the the operator asked right the operator asked based on the reservoir simulator uh, simulation models they asked for several tunnels at certain you know um, locations and so yes we did that um, post simulation the the production rate was way higher more than double um, and the payoff was only six days even when calculated the the largest volume of acid right just because the production rate was so much higher. Um, all right, so in summary, um, today I talk about uh, several topics. It's a, it's a very broad, uh, you know, um, um, 
Matic Sassi Dising and Asi tunneling are very broad uh, topics and and you know I try to simplify as much as I could just for the given time but um, uh, what I want to you know what I want to uh, show is that for both Matic Sassi Dising and Asi tunneling uh, although they are used for significant amount of time going forward if they are going to be used um, probably even more than before we need to cut their cost by optimizing by using data data analytics actually by optimizing the operations in such a way that the production rates post uh, post stimulation are, are um, you know optimal or maximum um, and and you saw for us it for instance, I didn't even talk about data because actually I left before we, we added telemetry, we added sensors in the bottom hall assembly, but um, we didn't uh, we didn't have any field trial uh, with that after that. Um, but it's really, really important. It's very valuable actually to have that kind of data and to have a real time um, data analytics you know, workflow um, that helps the engineers on location to to make decision and optimize the, the pumping schedule on the fly. And so, um, in terms of current R&D efforts, uh, so now I'm I'm still working on quantifying the erosional effects of uh, fluid jetting uh, and optimizing the nozzle design and, and fluid fluid usage um, for different types of you know acid formulations, for different types of uh, of rocks, for different types of um, uh, you know downfall conditions, and and so on and so forth, and. Um, as a takeaway from this talk, um, um, there is significant impact for R&D related to matrix acidizing and acid tunneling uh, with direct impact actually to field operations to maintain or even increase hydrocarbon production with lower operational costs. So that's my takeaway for the talk. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, and now I'm happy to take your questions. Are you able to determine downhole the dissolution pattern, phase optimal or uniform dissolution? Um, that's a really great question. Um, it depends on what kind of sensors you have. If you are talking about uh, optical fiber itself, so temperature data or acoustic data, um, what you need to do actually is to come up with some kind of models to correlate one to the other, right? Um, if you are talking about different other sensors, then probably you know you can put into um, into the the bottom hole assembly some kind of sensor, single point sensors that uh, need to be you know in direct contact with the fluid. Um, and again, it's not, in my opinion, it's not only the sensor capability to Major that I mean we know what kind of sensors we have in in our industry, but it's most importantly the capability to relate the major data to um, any any other outcome. To what extent is matrix acidizing used for carbon storage operation? Is there any need for acid uh, acidizing or tunneling in geothermal application? Are there unique challenges for this application? So actually, these are three uh, three different questions, right? Um, so um, let me uh, let me take them one by one. Um, so first, carbon storage operations. Um, in terms of carbon storage operations, um, there are several things that we can do, right? So first of all, we are injecting carbon into the formation. Now, do we need matrix acidizing? Um, matrix acidizing usually is to is to use to take out hydrocarbons from from formation, right? Um, if we use to if we need to use matrix acidizing to increase the injectivity of the well, sure that can be done and should be done. You just need to make sure that uh, you know CO2 is compatible with whatever acid formulation, whatever fluid. Um, and also, I would say that you need to make sure that you put your acid where it's needed. So first of all, you need to somehow come up with um, an injectivity profile, um, and then and then to make sure that you 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 pump your acid where where it's needed. That's first for geothermal application. That's a really good question. Um, so uh, matrix acidizing for sure is used currently in um, in. Um, Geothermal wells. Um, 
not as frequent as in hydrocarbon wells, but it is used and, and there are very clear, you know, um, uh, rules on how to do that. Now, acid tunneling, I'm not aware of any geothermal well that acid tunneling was used. However, that being said, um, by all means, I think acid uh, tunneling, it's a, um, it's a potential technology for enhanced geothermal systems, just like you know, radial drilling is discussed nowadays in different in different um, you know uh, geothermal circles. Um, and so and so, yes, here at UT, um, I'm planning to design a core flooding instrument um, and and test exactly acid tunneling for um, um, for geothermal applications. Um, and then are there unique challenges for these applications? So yes, um, that obviously different unique challenges um, for both. Um, I wouldn't say in terms of placement, but in uh, acid placement, but I would say in terms of um, chemistry itself, um, as I said, in for hydrocarbon applications, we are using different diverters. Um, are those still applicable for the type of rocks we have for carbon storage and uh, geothermal um, applications? Um, that absolutely we need to look at. Um, and and I would be more than happy actually to do experiments in here to 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 figure out uh, um, uh, how that works. So yeah, great, uh, great uh, questions, great comments. Um, so uh, any of you, actually, I couldn't see your names, but if you want to uh, follow up on those, please stop by and we can talk a little bit more. Um, this semester I'm teaching uh, a geothermal energy engineering uh, class, graduate class. Um, I, these kind of questions we get now, uh, uh, very, very engaging. So, um, um, yeah, uh, by all means, let me know if you have any other comments, questions. Um, and um, thank you very much again for your time. Yeah, so uh, I'd just like to thank our speaker again. Um, thanks so much, Dr. Levescu, for a uh, very interesting talk. And I'd like to thank all of our viewers for, for attending uh, this month. Uh, please come back and, and share our webinar series with your colleagues. Uh, we do post these on YouTube after the fact, so if you'd like to, um, and it should be up in a few days, so if you'd like to share the, the YouTube link with your colleagues as well, that'd be great. Um, and do tune in next month for Dr. Wynn's uh, talk, um, which is going to be the second Tuesday of the month. All right, thanks again.